topics and opinions expressed on the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4WN Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4WN Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4WN Radio. This is Beyond Confidence with your host, Divya Parikh. Do you want to live a more fulfilling life? Do you want to live your legacy and achieve your personal, professional, and financial goals? Well, coming up on Divya Parikh's Beyond Confidence, you will hear real stories of leaders, entrepreneurs, and achievers who have stepped into discomfort, shattered their status quo, and are living the life they want. You will learn how relationships are the key to achieving your aspirations and financial goals. Moving your career or business forward does not have to happen at the expense of your personal or family life, or vice versa. Learn more at www.diviapark.com and you can connect with Divya at contact at diviapark.com. This is Beyond Confidence, and now here's your host, Divya Park. Good morning. It's Tuesday and it's one of the best times for me because I get to be with you. And not only that, I get to connect with new guests. And to me, life is all about learning, evolving the experience. Because as we live our lives, what we experience is our lives. And what we put into the experiences that becomes our lives as well. And here's what I can share with you all is that thank you, thank you, thank you for everyone who has got our books because partial profits from our books go to help entrepreneurs all across the globe. And I can do that because of you. So if you have not got your books, please get one of our books i always find that expert to influencer and the entrepreneurs got in are the most valuable and of course there are the books but those are one of my favorite books out of the books that i have written and remember to keep the kindness circle going take an hour spread it over a month and be kind to someone with no strings attached so let's invite our guest Welcome, Phil. Hey, Divya. How are you? Thank you for having me on. Oh, it's good to have you. So, Phil, usually we start out from childhood. Do you recall a person or a moment from your childhood that left a mark on you? Oh, a bunch. But in preparation for this show, I was thinking about technology. And I think I was 12 years old when I got a Commodore 64, which is now laughable. Uh, when it comes to compute power and it was just really drawn to what it can do. And I've always been a bit of an early adopter when it came to technologies like smartphone and the web back in 1995, some of my friends from grad school said when you could register for courses online at Cornell with this portal called bear access, you said you were just all, you wouldn't shut up about it. (laughs) So (laughs) I think, um, yeah, having gone to, to Carnegie Mellon as an undergrad, I've always appreciated technology. And when I got into the workforce, um, it, it still intrigued me because there was many times, as I'm sure we'll talk about today, a better way of doing something, um, but people either wouldn't adopt it or would actively fight it. So I, I've been with my books um, and consulting experiences um, thinking a lot about change management, because as I write in the new book, and I'm sure we'll talk about this later, and I just don't see how we're going back to pre-pandemic times. Absolutely, you're spot on. And when you were talking about the computers, I still remember one of the monitors that I had, it was gigantic. And of course, (laughs) in the initial stages, there were no laptops. Humongous, like, you know, gosh, it occupied my whole desk. (laughs) <laughs> Those big CRT monitors and yeah, it, I, I, yeah, it was, I remember on some consulting assignments, it was difficult to find a um, place to, to write something down on a piece of paper because between the keyboard, the monitor, the mouse pad, and now with our flat screens and our tablets and our phones, 
and our watches and God knows what else <laughs> is coming. Um, it's really remarkable how the technology has progressed, but I find, um, feel free to chime in, that a lot of times the issues are, are very similar, whether it's around change management or free speech or organizational politics or whatever. Um, I think a lot about Nietzsche's quote, time is a flat circle. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And because we forget that behind the technology, people are still people. And if we are looking at the evolution, it takes a long time. I mean, if we look at ourselves, the humans on the evolution of Earth, we have just emerged. I don't recall where I read this, but it was either on somebody's podcast or I read it somewhere. We showed up around like 11.45 p.m. if we were to consider a whole year from January 1st to December 31st of Earth's life, we showed up at like 11.45. So our brains are still developing and brain still does not recognize the technology. So now we are talking about, you brought up a good point about pre-pandemic. And of course, just a couple of years back, it was, we heard about a couple of trends. One was the great resignation, the quiet quitting, where it was employee market after a very, very long time. Usually it's been an employer's market. So now we are going back to it and there are a lot of companies that are mandating presence all five days or hybrid work. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think Divya that those who try to force everyone to the office five days a week will fail. Uh, But to me, it's not unreasonable. In fact, it's quite reasonable for management to prod people into the office once in a while. Now we can talk about the number of days that people should spend in the office, but I think that long ago, and the data certainly backs this up, Microsoft has done a ton of studies about employee productivity. Not only when we had to work exclusively remotely during lockdown, were we as productive as we were going into the office? In some cases, we were more so. The average American pre-pandemic commute was 37 minutes. Well, if you get that back, even three days a week, Right, you're talking about how's my math? 225 or take minutes. Um, so it's what you know, close to four hours a week that you could have to to work if you want, but to also you know, take care of your ch- children or spend time with your, um, you know, your significant other, or play golf or tennis or chess, whatever you like to do. So I I understand why companies like Disney, Twitter, Salesforce are mandating people come to the office. Um, but to me, it's it's very short sighted um, to mandate that all the work needs to be done in the office. Um, you could argue that that wasn't true ten years ago. It's certainly not true now. Um, we've got powerful broadband connectivity. It's not like a, we use mainframe computers nearly as much in an era of cloud computing. We can take out our phones and, for better or worse, um, be productive anytime, anywhere. Um, but I think it's misplaced um, in companies like Twitter that insist upon that will eventually see a talent drain. And the more that I researched the new book, the more that became obvious. And companies that embrace hybrid and remote work, I would argue would have an advantage over companies that don't. I saw a statistic, I think it was from Payscale, that the average employee will accept something like 8% less in salary uh, for for flexibility. So Mm -hmm. if you think about it, employees are happier and potentially less expensive not to mention things that I'm sure we'll talk about later, like reduced real estate costs and carbon footprint and all that. Oh, absolutely. You definitely brought up a good point. So let's talk about the millennials and Z-Gen, especially Z-Gen, because what has happened during pandemic is that they do have a desire to travel, especially Z-Gen. So several of my clients were used to working remotely, living in a country where the living cost was pretty low. And now when you are coming back to hybrid work, how can the employers handle that segment of talent? Yeah, it's, I think, a lot easier said than done. Um, I'd start off with reconfiguring offices. Um, We don't want to, if we've got a desk at home and we're heads down coding or writing or uh, designing if we're for designers, um, why do we need to do that if we're in an office? So if um, some of the companies I studied uh, for the new book, like Cisco, Marriott, Samsung, um, have spent quite a bit of money reconfiguring the offices so they're more destinations. 
And Cisco is one of my favorite examples. Prior to the pandemic in Manhattan, they had spent, I think, um, they had allocated roughly 70% of the physical space towards individual work and 30 for group or collaborative work. But when they realized that we weren't going back to traditional pre-pandemic work customs, they spent a lot of money inverting it. So 30% of the work is dedicated, or the space, excuse me, is dedicated to individual work and the other 70 is for group work. So I do think to your point that there is this need of some folks to want to connect with their colleagues. You, certainly if you're a manager, um, it's very difficult to get a sense of someone in exclusively remote way, even though there are tools that you can use in Slack and Microsoft Teams and all sorts of survey um, analytics type tools that will give you a pulse. But I'd argue that there's something lost over Zoom. You seem pleased talking to me now, but for all I know, I'm irritating you. Um, of course, people can always dissemble in person, but I think it behooves millennials and younger folks as well to get to the office. That way you build up that social capital with folks in a way that you just cannot do by sending a bunch of messages in Slack or Teams or Microsoft, um, Microsoft Teams or Zoom. So it's a challenge though. Um, you know, we've proven that we can be productive out of the office. So you, I think we need to give employees a reason to go there beyond just you know, um, threatening them with the stick. Mended. Now I completely agree with you. And uh, what you said is that there is definitely something lost over Zoom because there's nothing like sitting across a person and just as one of my personal experiences, I used to do a lot of speaking engagements. Prior to the pandemic, pandemic came, you became so comfortable <laughs> in the pajamas and maybe just having a t-shirt on the top, like, you know, or a more professional and you're moving around and that comfort became, and brain is lazy. So brain loves to be just lazy and, you know, do the minimal. Now that said, it was amazing that during 2021 or it was 2022, I'm not sure. I was doing a keynote speaking for one of kicking off one of the company's annual event. And when I was there and just having that energy in the room. So yes, you know, we are talking over here and I love doing podcasts where yes, with Zoom, we can reach lots and lots of people and that's what the advantage is of digital and that said when i was speaking in that auditorium with 200 people and just the energy flowing that interaction and engagement between us it's so palpable and it cannot be replaced what you're on zoom so a question that pops up which uh, one of my clients kind of went through is that they would say that, okay, company has given us the option we can come any day, but then how do we know what days my team members are coming or my manager is coming? So it's so hard to coordinate. So what would you advise or what have you found writing your new book to yep. circumvent that situation? Well, a lot of companies, as you probably know, Divya, are landing on core days. So they'll want people there. I think a common framework right now is Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. And I was reading a Wall Street Journal article a couple of weeks ago about how Monday is the new battleground. No one wants to be in the office on Friday. But yes, Thank there you. needs to be some degree of coordination. My previous book, Low Code, No Code, describes the need for new apps that the pandemic um, created. Um, prior to the pandemic, yes, people worked in a hybrid fashion or remotely, but not to the same extent. And the data certainly bears that out. Now, you're right. We do need an app to track who's going to be in the office for a bunch of reasons. First, we don't want to schlep to the office an hour each way to find that my team isn't there, right? Why did I come in if I'm the only one, right? Beyond that, um, and I'm sure we'll talk about this later, um, we have to acknowledge the fact that some companies are leaning into this. Um, if you look at office, office occupancy rates, there's something like 50% in cities, it varies. And that's in stark contrast to sporting events or um, air, airlines. Um, they're basically back to pre-pandemic capacity, but offices are not. And a lot of the leases that landlords signed prior to the pandemic are going to lapse within the next two to three years. It will be very interesting to see how many of them renegotiate or just walk away. And that's a bigger discussion. But the point is that if we do have to answer your question, only 
room for 100 people and 120 come in, you could imagine the fallout of people going, hold on a second, I just commuted an hour <laughs> and you don't have a place for me to sit. That doesn't right. make a lot of sense. So getting back to the previous question, it, it does behoove companies to really reimagine the workplace. You know, why are people coming in if it is to conduct training or meet colleagues or brainstorm or something along those lines? I'm all in, right? I'll happily commute. But if it's just to be seen because my manager doesn't trust me, or if it's to sit down with my you know, keyboard and my headphones on and just write because I'm a writer or a speaker, well, we can do that from anywhere. So it makes it more difficult than proximity bias is a real thing. Hybrid is hard. Say what you will about compelling people into the office every day, but at least everyone's on the same footing. You know, what happens when, and I don't have the answer to this question, uh, but what happens when some managers are more lax when it comes to remote work? And you say, well, how come manager A lets you do this, but manager B doesn't? And one size isn't going to fit all. If I work in physical security or I'm a chef, um, I probably need to be on premise most of the time. I guess I can cook from home and bring it, but let's leave that out. But if I'm a coder, um, I might need to come in the office once a week, once a month, once a quarter. I'd still argue that it makes sense in companies like Automatic, um, the company behind WordPress that runs about 43% of the web is distributed and they'll get everyone together when it's there's not a pandemic in exotic locales like Greece or Monaco or something, uh, because there is benefit of knowing, of knowing your colleagues. And even if you just have a drink or break bread or make jokes or play some cheesy icebreaker. Um, so yeah, there's, um, uh, this is my fourth book on the future of work and there probably are more in me. So uh, a lot of things that we took <laughs> for, for granted prior to the COVID-19 pan outbreak, um, we're really re-examining. Yeah, and I really love how you have mentioned about that. Like, it depends on the job, it depends on the manager, and it depends upon how you are creating that environment and creating that experience for your team. So, just as an example, like you know, what we did was one of my clients who was a director and he had a team of managers. So, what they did was for their meeting for their division they designated days and then the individual managers sat down and brought in all the team members and said like okay what are the two days where everybody comes in so we can overcome this issue like there's somebody coming on one day somebody's not coming so people knew and people know like you know when people are coming in they look forward to it and anything that they need to tackle with their brainstorming together that's when they make use of the days and then maximize it because then that brings them together. And as you talked about, that manager can get the pulse. Who's engaged, who's not, because these are the times when you can definitely find out. So you talk about fractions that now the whole real estate and hiring has changed. Let's hear some more about that. Yeah. You know, many of the forces in my new book, Divya, are, I won't mm -hmm. want to say obvious, but certainly topical. Uh, things like artificial intelligence, uh, the generative type like chat GPT, mid journey, stability AI, um, my LinkedIn feed, as I'm sure yours is as well, is just filled with those types of things. And inflation's topical, employee empowerment, uh, but blockchain and immersive technologies like Apple's new Vision Pro uh, may not be on everyone's radar, but the one that people consistently when they look at the cover of the book and there's a, a series of icons, nobody gets the last one, which is a fraction. It's X over Y. They say, what do you mean by that? And it really boils down to two parts. First, you're right. This notion of fractional real estate or a fractional office. Um, I mean, there's been co-working spaces for 20 or 30 years. Uh, companies like WeWork really ushered in that error and made us rethink what an office could be. You know, should it be ugly gray cubicles? Well, we don't, not only can we create, I would argue, a better qualitative office, but we don't need as much or as many of them or certainly as much square footage. So there are plenty of startups that are figuring out ways to split the office creatively. For example, if you're only going to have employees in the office Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you really don't need an office 
Tuesday and Thursday. So you could purchase the building or rent it and then sublease at a note Dropbox made. I think it was last year for one quarter. Uh, it something It was in the tens of millions of dollars of revenue subleasing their space right. because they didn't need it. But if, if you think about it, kind of like cloud computing, um, you pay as you go. So if you have a big bill from Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure, it means that your employees and customers use the services a lot. That's a lot more efficient economically than spending a ton of money on servers and only using 10% of them. The other aspect of fractions, Divya, is around employment. And when you think about a chief legal officer, chief marketing officer, no one would say that Meta Amazon, Microsoft would get away with that. In fact, many of those companies are so large that there may be a CFO or a COO of a particular division. I know that when Salesforce purchased Slack a couple of years ago for $28 billion, they kept the Slack management team on and the role was still CEO or CFO of Slack because it's such a big entity. Mm -hmm. But if you think about the smaller companies, um, three, 400 people, which really isn't that small, if you think about it, um, perhaps they're dealing with a number of legal issues around generative AI and is there copyright infringement? Well, a chief legal officer could run you $400,000 a year plus bonus benefits, stock you know, options if you're um, issuing them. Could you afford someone two or three days a week? Someone who's effectively locked in, has got a company xyz.com email address, but is only working a couple of days a week. Certainly side hustles are pretty prevalent. And if you think about generative AI, um, I think it was um, Gartner, McKinsey or Goldman Sachs, I forget which one, but released a study maybe two months ago that these tools should be able to automate around 25% of the average white collar's work. Then maybe that frees you up two days a week to not have to deal with some of the administrative things or when it comes to writing, maybe uh, one of these generative AI tools can generate a draft of something and you're just editing the draft as opposed to starting from scratch, you know, ditto for code or images. So fractions are a bit um, uh, less than obvious for most folks, but I'm glad that I included that one because it does represent kind of a natural extension of wherever we've been going. I'll, I'll be the first person to admit that temporary employment is not new, but typically we haven't had it at senior levels, but that's starting to change. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's important to pay attention to the trends that will be emerging because it helps both the organizations as well as employees or professionals prepare for the new things that are coming. And here's the thing you mentioned about being an early adopter. I'm an early adopter too. And unless, and that involves a play of different aspects. So one is the mindset, like, oh, no, 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 I'm not, I'm going to resist anything new that's going to come in. And that makes the transition even more harder. Versus if you're prepared that, okay, sitting down. So let's, I want to punt it back to you. Let's say there are employees. There are different. So let's say people who are in their 30s, 40s, who still have 25, 30 years of professional life left, how can they prepare for this emerging trend of fractions? Well, I, I'd argue at a high level, uh, it's important to be aware of it. And you can deny that these things are happening, but I think that that's silly. In fact, towards the end of the book, I lay out a number of different strategies and hope is not an option. Um, it, I agree with you. It, it depends on where you are. If you're 58 years old, you may be able to avoid a lot of these trends for two or three years. But I agree with you. If you are in your you know, even mid 40s, never mind younger, um, you're going to deal with fractions and generative AI, automation, inflation, all the forces that I cover in the book. I, I just don't see any way around it. So with respect to fractions, you're right. Going back to one of your earlier points, it takes us a while to get our arms around these things. You don't just hit a switch. If there's anything that I've learned about enterprise technology over the last, oh gosh, now 25 years, it's that it takes time for people to change. Um, yes, you hear about apps like Reels that go live and I think what was it, within seven days they had 10 million users. Um, and there is, um, I think, um, if you look at the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years, um, an increase in the speed of, of how we adopt these tools. Um, that's pretty inarguable at this point. Um, 
but it's just not as weird as people think it is. And when I see on LinkedIn, these groups dedicated to fractional leadership or fractional real estate, um, you can fight it, but you can also see it as an opportunity. Maybe you do have a passion as a musician, but you're not going to make a living at it because it's a very difficult thing to do. Oh, ditto for a writer. So embracing a side hustle or another vocation, even if you don't necessarily make a lot of money on it, may not be such a bad thing. If I could get, I talked to my neighbor about this. He said, if I could um, do my job in four days a week and make 25% or 20% less money to spend more time with my wife and kids, I would love to do that. So I guess that you could fear these things or you can kind of understand them and try to lean into them. Um, and I don't think that full-time employment is going the way of the dodo, but I do think if you ask me this question in five years, that we are at the precipice of this trend of, of fractions. Um, maybe it's a little bit less hyped than automation or generative AI tools like chat GPT. But, uh, you know, Einstein said, I think, uh, I think it was Einstein, the most powerful law in the universe is compounding uh, or exponential growth or compounding interest. So if we see something at one or two and it goes from two to four, four to eight, before you know it, it gets really large. Mm -hmm. And why not? The way I see it is that so many times people are in their jobs and they don't find meaning in their work. They're doing it. And there's, I've had so many of my clients tell me, oh, I don't find the meaning in work. And at the same time, I'm not going to be able to make the money I want, the lifestyle I want to live doing the things that I'm passionate about. So that just kind of shows us that, you know, if you're bringing in generative AI, if it can free you up for that, even if it's a day and if you're doing that side hustle, so you're living a fuller and richer life. So why not? So being open to it. And that's why it's important to have conversations like this. And you talk about robots coming in and that's going to be impacting the white collar workers. So how did you arrive at that conclusion yeah. and the research? And if you can give us more context with that would be great. Yeah, automation to me, Divya, is a cousin of generative AI. Because if you think about, and I discuss automation a bit in my previous book, Low Code, No Code, but mm. um, when, there's a great quote from, I think it was a British politician. I forgot the name. It was something like automation frees us to be more human because it is not fulfilling work. I agree to do something in a very manual way. I can remember, gosh, now 25 years ago, I was working at a big pharma company and I graduated from an Ivy League school with a master's degree, blah, blah, blah. They were paying me a lot of money and aspects of our job were totally manual. In fact, when I had to import compensation records from Latin America, the 2,500 employees we supported in our division, I kid you not, I had to hit the enter key 2,500 times. And I was shaking my head going, this is insane. Um, and there still are very manual processes that exist that aren't terribly fulfilling. And in fact, they're dangerous. The pickers at Amazon notoriously burn out. Amazon's faced a number of hiring challenges over the years because in some cases they've run out of employees. Uh, and it's a very physical job. I've watched a PBS documentary that I think I quote in the new book about the dangers of doing the same thing eight, 10 hours a day, you know, being on your feet, you're basically a work athlete. And the day after work, you need to <laughs> relax. Um, and so there's that. Um, and it's not just abstract. Um, I start off that chapter of the book with the example of in Fort Worth, Texas, a robot McDonald's, there are no employees. It's you order on a kiosk and you enter whatever you want. And then all of a sudden a Big Mac or a quarter pounder with cheese comes out for you. Uh, but it isn't just blue collar work. In fact, based on my research, many of these generative AI type tools pose more of a threat to white collar work. I mentioned before the Goldman Sachs, I think it was study about how they can automate 25% of white collar tasks. You know, when I think about basically writing the same email over and over again, um, I, I don't do that because I have some automation tools on my computer. Why would I type the same thing six or seven times? I also stitched together a number of different tools uh, using some of these no-code, low-code applications because I despise efficiency. So 
I agree. It is freeing in the sense that AI can't do everything. We don't want it to do everything necessarily, but we don't enjoy for the most part filling out the same form over and over again. So if we can use AI and automation to make work qualitatively better, um, that sounds like an exciting opportunity, but it's a threat to folks who don't want to expand their horizon. Someone who's maybe 52 years old and is very comfortable doing the same thing over and over again. Um, that's not me. It's never been me, but I struggle um, to see a world in which that job exists or certainly pays a living wage. So again, I've got more questions than answers in this book. I, I certainly don't have all the answers, <laughs> but these are big trends. And, and getting back to your previous point about finding meaning in work, I, I agree with you. During the pandemic, particularly lockdown, we asked ourselves some, ourselves some big, hairy questions. What is the purpose of the office? What is the purpose of work? Uh, no, not everyone's got a self-actualizing or self-fulfilling or fulfilling type of job. But I think more of us want that from our employers. What do you think? Yeah, you're absolutely right. That what is that work about? And that's where what happened was during pandemic, because there's so much uncertainty. I mean, there's uncertainty in life every day. People don't realize that we fall into a routine when we, OK, you know, I'm driving, I'm waking up. I'm going for groceries, but we don't realize that what's going to happen the next moment. And that's how the brain survives because brain wants certainty. But in pandemic, there was so much uncertainty that people started asking existential questions. People wanted to know what was there to life? Like, is there more to life besides having that golden handcuffs or just doing the work? doing the grunt work sometimes, or even if it is strategy, like, you know, how much strategy and problem solving you can do. So what was life about? And from that emerged, I think, so a higher awareness of what life could be, how life could be more richer and how you could bring more meaning to life. So it's important as circling back to where you mentioned earlier is that it's important that organizations pay attention to it. And you mentioned about Cisco reimagining the workplace. So it circles back to where we started. Yeah, I agree. There's, um, I think, enormous opportunity in this chaos, to paraphrase from one of my favorite quotes. Um, I, I think there is an enormous opportunity for organizations to, uh, as I write in the back of the book, um, steer into the skid. And embrace these things and no it's it's not going to be easy you're going to make mistakes but uh, even in a loose labor market you could argue that top talent has got no shortage of choices about where to work well a the employee the labor market has been tight i think the department of labor announced that last week it was 3.6 percent which is remarkable um, so plenty of people have got options about where they want to work and then compounding that we've got this rapid adoption of remote and hybrid work. So historically, you've been pretty much confined to employers in your vicinity, unless you wanted to move your family, or your company was going to pay relo. Um, that's not necessarily the case now, to the extent that more employers have embraced hybrid and remote work. And even if you had to get on a plane once a month to go to the office, you still may come out ahead. So to me, it's just irresponsible to ignore these forces um, I just don't see how we're reverting to pre-pandemic work. And mm -hmm. you, can, you can fight that, but you can also say, well, there's this opportunity to provide a, a better workplace, to be a better employer, to contribute more to society, to be a more humane company. Um, but that requires a shift in mindset. And I'd be naive to think that everyone's going to do that. Absolutely. So I want to hit upon you, have brought up your previous book, low code, no code. And from what I'm gauging and what you're sharing is that like, you know, and this is like, I've heard about so many software job openings in cybersecurity that we have a shortage of tech workers. So there's a lot of tech issues that are going around. How can organizations look at the situation and work through it. 
Yeah, it's a simple question, but it begins with accepting the fact that these tools are valuable and they're ubiquitous, they're affordable, they're user-friendly, and to your point, IT departments and software developers are strapped. In the book, I cite a ton of research on just this severe dearth of coders. And there are, in an era of shadow IT, which is a fancy way of saying that people don't need to go to a centralized IT department to procure resources, people can use software as a service. They can use open source software um, to basically get things past the goalie, so to speak. Um, you can fight this and penalize employees who take advantage of this, or you can embrace it. And to me, it's completely unreasonable to expect people, given, as we were talking about earlier, the rate of change, department heads who have PL responsibility to wait a year for IT to even look at developing a new system. That's just mm. not reasonable. So if you look at Notion and Airtable and Webflow and Bubble and a lot of these tools, um, they are incredibly powerful. As I said, they're user-friendly, they're affordable, um, and they eliminate the IT business divide. By that, I mean that historically when companies have developed software, they, if you use the waterfall method, they've collected a list of requirements and tried to plan out the next year, 18 months, whatever. Agile methods like Scrum release software a little bit at a time because they realize the folly of trying to predict the future Regardless of how you implement software, though, you need to be a developer. Um, that's not the case with the citizen developers that I write about in the book. If you can work a mouse, that's why the cover of that book has got a, um, a, a cursor. That's not an accident. And it's got building blocks kind of like Tetris. It's basically a metaphor for how you can build pretty powerful applications without knowing a lick of code. That doesn't mean that Apple is going to run its entire supply chain on Airtable. That's just not reasonable. But when I think about people sending a bunch of emails back and forth or using a Google spreadsheet and they still don't know the status of a particular project or product launch or whatever, I just say to them, you know, there is a better way of tracking things. Oh, I'm not a coder. That's OK. You don't have to be. No, that's fantastic. So let's say, you know, in our audience, we have a lot of entrepreneurs and we have a lot of listeners who are professionals. So you talked about that you don't need to know the coding. I mean, I did some <laughs> long, long time back. So for people like myself or like, you know, who are entrepreneurs or an executive coaches or for people who are professionals, can you share some practical applications where they could just kind of take two or three apps like you have talked about and simplify their lives and open up some hours because people are always looking for more time. Yeah, 100%. There is uh, no shortage of tools, and I break them down into, I basically created a taxonomy for the book, which was more challenging than I thought because these tools overlap so much. Even a tool like Notion is like an amoeba. It constantly morphs. And I want to say three months ago, they launched generative AI inside of it. That was not on my radar. Uh, when I wrote that particular book. So again, things change very quickly. And it's tough for us to get our heads around a tool like Notion because it does so many things. We're so used to saying, does this need to be a Word doc or a PowerPoint presentation or a spreadsheet or an access database or something? Uh, those distinctions with a tool like Notion or, or Coda or some of the other ones like it um, basically fall apart. So to answer your question, um, there's one example in the book of a company that was building a mobile app and they were doing it in a very code centric way. And it just wasn't going very well. It was over budget, you know, past the deadline. Mm -hmm. I've seen this movie a thousand times before. And they used a tool called bubble that was very visual drag and drop. Um, they wound up liking it so much that they completely junked the previous incarnation of the app. Um, or even as a small business, uh, there's a great example of a guy who at the time was living in Florida. Now he lives in Sweden worked at a family party planning business and they had a number of different issues one of which was that all, with all these different drivers they'd have to put on a voicemail i kid you not this was up until three or four years ago everyone's schedule but the limit on a voicemail is 90 seconds so people had to call up and listen and 47 seconds in okay phil you need to be here at eight o'clock and divya need to be here at 805 and that is how they did it and sometimes they'd have to re-record it a bunch of times because 90 seconds is a lot to put in information for 50 drivers. 
And then there were drivers who spoke mostly Spanish. So they had a hard time understanding. So using Airtable, a, a whip smart citizen developer with no coding experience built an app that would text all the drivers the night before their message. Hmm. Right? Here's where you need to be. Based on that, then they wound up also creating an app on the phone and using the phone's camera to track when someone turned in a truck because sometimes the drivers would damage the trucks, but figuring out who did what when was very difficult. So by scanning a QR code, again, not requiring any code, so think mouse, not keyboard, they were able to effectively eliminate um, this mystery of who banged the door here because the drivers, when they came in, would take a picture of it and say, yes, I checked this truck in at 8.07 p.m. Uh, in Miami on Thursday. You don't see any damage, so it wasn't me. And then they could identify the drivers who were maybe not that responsible. Um, so there are all sorts of examples in that book. I'm a big fan of case studies. I do my research and I cite my statistics like a good author. But I also know that People like Malcolm Gladwell are very successful in part because they can tell a good story. I don't think I'm nearly as good of a writer as he is, but I think that when it comes to technology, um, you can spew specs at people all day long about compute power or RAM or whatever. That's not really going to move the needle. But when they hear a story like that, they might say, oh, well, we're really not in the party planning business, but we do have a number of manual processes that are quite frankly, error laden, inefficient, expensive, what if we can automate all that? So automation is just one of the many benefits of low-code, no-code tools. Uh, but there are lots of examples in, in that book as well. Well, fantastic. Thank you for sharing. And I can definitely second what you're sharing is that because so many pieces of my business, it's you get the tools. And of course, you got to see, you know, what are your requirements and then seeing what fits your need the best. So, for example, if you want to build a website, there are a lot of tools out there. So, for example, I would have lead pages and that lead pages is connected with an automation with active campaign. And folks, I do not have any affiliate links here. So I'm just sharing what I have done. And then that active campaign is, again, connected with Calendly, which is the scheduling link. So rather than working in business, you can work on business. And of course, from what it sounds like, we will definitely have to get both the books from Phil. So Phil, if you can share again, the titles of both of your books and where can we find them? Yeah, well, you can find out all of my books on philsimon.com, but the most recent two are The Nine, The Tectonic Forces Reshaping the Workplace and low-code, no-code citizen developers and the surprising future of business applications. I like to think that they don't suck. Oh, fantastic. It's uh, been a pleasure speaking with you. Is there anything that you'd like to share before we bring our conversation to a close? I just want to thank you for having me on, Divya. I enjoyed it. Oh, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you for joining us and giving us the nuggets of your wisdom and research. And thank you for that. And thank you listeners for joining us because without you, the show would not be possible. Thank you Juan for making the show technically possible. So be well until next time and I'll see you next Tuesday. Take care. Thank you for being part of Beyond Confidence with your host Divya Park. We hope you have learned more about how to start living the life you want. Each week on Beyond Confidence, you hear stories of real people who have experienced growth by overcoming their fears and building meaningful relationships. During Beyond Confidence, Divya Park shares what happened to her when she stepped out of her comfort zone to work directly with people across the globe. She not only coaches people how to form heart connections, but also transform relationships to mutually beneficial partnerships as they strive to live the life they want. If you are ready to live the life you want and leverage your strengths, learn more at www.divyapark.com. And you can connect with Divya at contact at We look forward to you joining us next week.